Oh, I remember when I used to be a mid-range card back in my youth. Grandpa, what's a mid-range? Well, I'll tell you. You see, children, when an aggro archetype and a control archetype love each other very much, they... Okay, why don't I take this one? Welcome back, everyone, to my advanced Faria series. I'm Moonfasa, and today we're going to be talking about archetypes. This is a really important first concept to understand because having the intuitive knowledge of different archetypes and how each plays out can help us immensely with every other decision we make in the game, and especially helps out if you want to become better at deck building. An archetype is sort of a general game plan your deck is trying to achieve, be that rushing to your opponent's orb for his thing, slow playing and building up to some nasty combo, or maybe somewhere in between. Here are the most basic forms of archetypes we're going to be talking about today. These exist in every type of summoner-style card game out there, but Faria, of course, has this unique feature of having lands and Faria wells on top of the board. So there's a lot of things to pay attention to when understanding these archetypes, and general as they are, they are still quite well defined. These five archetypes may seem a little abstract at first, I mean they're not written in any rule book or anything, so why do so many players come to agree on these particular categories? And there are a lot of factors to this, but the most important to understand is that each of these archetypes is going to have their own sort of pacing that they want to play the game at, which could affect certain decisions like killing or not killing a creature, going for your opponent's orb at certain moments in the game, or building lands at certain points. The overall special land requirement of your deck is something you're going to want to keep track of because of this. Lands determine how early or late in the match a card can be played. It's always best to keep your overall land counts low, but it's even more important to keep low land counts the more aggressive you want the deck to be. And these different archetypes won't play the same way as each other. In fact, most of them can't play the same way, at least within the general flow of gameplay. Control lists, for example, and very briefly put, want to keep the board clear at all times. So they will have a ton of removal options in their deck to back up this game plan. What they won't have is large amounts of creatures, probably. So if the control deck isn't playing conservatively with their few creatures and going for aggressive plays, they're going to run out of creatures to play very quickly and lose any presence they had on board, as well as lose out on valuable card draws from the power wheel, since they probably had to build extra lands for those aggressive plays. Most aggressive archetypes are of course designed to be aggressive, so they have a lot of fuel in their decks to support aggressively built lands and creature placements, and they'll have less support for keeping the board clear, meaning they'll really have to think hard about when and where they want their limited removal events to come down. Each card you add into your deck is either going to complement one of these five archetypes or go against it. And this is where deck building can get tricky, because most decks are going to excel at only one of these archetypes. And if you try and water down your deck with multiple archetypes, like I see so many new players fall into the trap for, it can really hurt his performance. These all play very differently from one another, as I mentioned, and if you're not optimizing your deck towards just one archetype, your opponent probably will be, and that's where your deck may be failing. Not only that, but the cards themselves often can only find homes in a few or maybe even just one of these archetypes. Origin Monk, for example, really only fits into Rush. And while this is easy to tell just by looking at his card text, not all cards are this obvious. Lands and Feria costs play a huge role in making cards viable for each archetype. But before we start getting too deep into individual archetypes and how they function, we need to understand a few things about the game first. I'm sure you know this already, but much of the gameplay in this game is very focused around these Feria wells on the sides here. And the general land structure in most games will kind of follow these wells on the sides because of how important they are. And we haven't talked about land placement yet in this series, I have a whole other video planned for that, but we do need to briefly touch on the importance of these sides. So if land progression tends to follow the wells, which side do we start on to achieve this? Left or right? Does it matter? Well, yeah, it actually plays a huge role in most archetypes which side we choose to start with. And we won't really get into why in this video, I'll save that for the future, but for now you'll just have to trust me. To make this decision of which side to start with, we have to consider a wide variety of information that includes our archetype, our opponent's archetype, 
how our opponent chose to open their lands, and our starting hand. All of these factors play a role in deciding whether we want to follow and fight the same side that our opponent chose to open on, or try to dodge their land investment and build towards the opposite side. Now, it's not always possible to choose which side to go down relative to your opponent's land placement, because they could very well just drop their starting land in the center hex, and if you're going second, you could also drop your land center, hold the explore card, and that forces them to pick a side first. But if you're going first, you don't have this luxury, and your opponent will have the slight advantage of being able to make that choice of sides instead. So now that we have that idea in our heads, let's finally get into the general archetypes I mentioned earlier, and talk specifics. We'll start with Rush. This is the fastest archetype in the game, in terms of pacing, with the goal of pushing lands towards your opponent's orb as fast as possible, and dumping a ton of early game pressure in the form of creatures. Now, we just talked about the importance of choosing sides, and Rush is an archetype that wants to be fighting your opponent's creatures and contesting their empty lands to make it difficult for them to play creatures safely. So instead of trying to follow the same side your opponent built lands to and possibly failing since you may end up going first, the Rush player wants to guarantee that they can contest their opponent and builds double neutrals straight down the center. The obvious disadvantage to this is that we give up the Faria Wells in favor of this acceleration, so we need to make up for this lost value somehow. We could just repetitively hit our opponent in the face until they're dead, but this is not actually a great way of looking at the Rush archetype. Remember when I said the game is very focused around the Faria Wells? Well, it's really no different in Rush's case either. But when you first run into a Rush deck and they're constantly hitting you in the face, it's pretty easy to assume this is all they're good for. But it's a little more nuanced than that. The Rush archetype is just meant to apply early pressure on their opponent's creatures, their lands, and their ability to collect from these Faria Wells. Even if the Rush player isn't collecting from these wells, though it is still highly beneficial for Rush decks to collect, they're at least applying pressure to the orb in ways that force their opponent away from the wells in order to relieve that pressure. Many of the yellow rush creatures like Origin Monk and Demonic Salmon benefit greatly from hitting the orb, so this is what they're going to do most of the time and try and draw you out from the wells by doing so. But this isn't typical of most rush decks since other colors and even other variants of yellow rush don't have access to these types of cards. So in other rush decks, you're actually going to see experienced players taking more value trades on your creatures and setting up camp on your wells as opposed to mindlessly slapping you in the face. In both scenarios though, keeping the defending player off as many collections as possible and poking in face hits every now and then is what the rush player needs to do to make up for their own lack of collections. And this, at its core, is what the rush archetype is all about. So if we want to look at cards that fit into the Rush archetype, we obviously want things that can be played as soon as possible to bring on the onslaught of creatures and pressure that stops any breathing room our opponent so desperately needs to counter this matchup. And the Yellow Rush archetype practically tells you how to build it with all of the when you hit face triggers, but in order to get that early pressure in other versions of Rush, we'll need cards with super low special land requirements, especially neutral creatures. Generally, the maximum special land requirement you'll want in a deck is two, maybe three at the absolute maximum if you have a good reason for it. If you're playing more than that, you're going to be giving your opponent too much time to set up a solid defense, and once your opponent gets a strong foothold on the board, there's usually no hope left for the rush deck to win anymore. Combat is another decent keyword to look out for, because even if these creatures are less statted than Maceman or Sagami Warrior, you can actually proc combat hits on your opponent's orb, which is great because it means you're not taking any retaliation damage. Queen's Guard pretty much checks all these boxes, being neutral, having combat, and the taunt can be quite useful to taunt your opponent's creatures out of collecting. So you'll see this card show up everywhere in rush lists. Other expensive creatures can sometimes work, since these can apply a ton of early pressure, and your opponent hasn't drawn many cards that early in the game, so the chances of finding hard removal are lower. But remember, you've given up a lot of well collections in this archetype, so you're not going to be able to afford too many expensive things. And this was just a brief talk about Rush and how it functions, but it is a real tough cookie to crackle in its own, so if you want more information on this archetype, I'll leave a link in the top right for my Countering Rush series. Now on to the next archetype. 
On the other end of the spectrum, we have Control. This archetype has no major concern with your opponent's orb, and instead will sit comfortably on both sides of your own orb, collecting Faria and removing anything your opponent plays. The win condition here is to simply gain more resources than your opponent by removing them before they can collect, and keeping your own collectors intact for as long as possible. And throughout this long grind of a match, you can either slowly make your way to their orb and hit them with whatever you have, or wait until fatigue sets in and poke them with a flame burst or two to guarantee your victory. Because our game plan revolves around removing everything we can, obviously we're gonna need a lot of removal cards, and that leaves little space for creatures. So you need to pick your creatures very carefully. They have to be cheap enough that you're not taking away too many resources from playing your removal cards, because this Faria you're investing into your creatures will ideally never have to fight enemy creatures, which is what most other archetypes are doing. They're investing Faria into creatures to use both as collectors and also to fight with, so these other archetypes can get their value back by using slightly better statted creatures. In control, we're usually not concerned about fighting, so the offensive stats of our creatures are not as important. The Defensive stats are, though, because we still are a bit concerned with our opponent having removal cards, and if we lose one collector on board, it may be a while before we're able to draw into another one. Divine Guardian is an excellent example of a creature to use in control. Super cheap at 2 cost and no lands, while having great defensive stats, along with the defensive keyword Divine. Now this is easy to think about in terms of survivability. Divine literally prevents this from getting blasted with hand removal, but what about other creatures that aren't so privileged. For these, we need to take a look at popular removal cards we may be expecting out of our opponent, and the most common ones will come in the form of 2 and 3 damage, which will usually cost 2 and 3 Faria respectively. So the obvious conclusion here is to pick creatures that have more than 3 life, but remember we want cheap creatures, and when we get into the 4 life range, creatures start to get a little more pricier than we'd like. It may not seem like it if you're newer to the game, but a 2 Faria Divine Guardian compared to like a 4 Faria Maceman is a massive, massive difference. So unless that 4 Faria card you're eyeing has a major benefit in your list overall, you really want to look for something cheaper. And it's actually okay to play into these 2 and 3 damage thresholds in the control archetype, because as your opponent, you're already struggling to get creatures to stick to the board. And in Faria, if you lose presence on the board, you're in for a real rough ride. So your opponent here really doesn't want to be spending Faria on things like Flame Burst. They want to be spending it on board presence. Now, 2 damage is a lot more manageable. Cypher's Wrath and Soul Drain are pretty cheap in comparison. Again, this might not seem like much of a difference, but even just one Faria in this game goes a long, long way. It makes such a big difference. So the best thresholds to shoot for are usually creatures with 3 life, since they're cheap, and Flame Burst is very expensive, or creatures that trade up over your opponent's removal, such as the apparent mascot now of this series, Farm Boy. This goodest boy will only cost you one Faria, while your opponent will often have to spend two to kill it. So this is the creature side of things, but we haven't even gotten into the main course here, which is the actual control cards. These should be pretty intuitive, we're just picking cards that remove other cards, but it's important to realize that these removal cards are quite specific. Last Nightmare is the only card in the game that simply destroys a creature. Everything else has conditions, like destroy a creature with three attack or less, and even Flame Burst is conditional because it really only removes creatures with three life or less. So because we need to use these cards on very specific creatures, we're going to have a couple issues. One is that games aren't going to be as simple as I first let on here. I mentioned that the control game plan is to remove anything your opponent plays, but with all these specific removal cards, this isn't really going to be the case, because we only get one natural card draw per turn. So if our opponent has a 4 life creature on board and we draw Flame Burst, well, we're out of luck if we don't have any other options in hand. And less obvious to this is if we draw that same Flame Burst, but our opponent has a 2 life creature instead. We could Flame Burst this, but much better would be to Cypher's Wrath for one Faria cheaper. So this can be a really tricky decision to make as the control player, whether you go for the clears now and stop your opponent's collections, or wait until you draw more efficient clears. The second issue with these specific removal tools is this makes for a lot of dead cards in your hand over the course of the game. Cards that are just going to sit there taking up a very valuable resource that you may or may not realize, which is the physical card slot itself. And I'll talk more in detail about 
about this in a future video, but cards are a resource, just as Faria is a resource. One thing we can do to help with this inherent downside of control is to include a lot of card draw in the deck. Unfortunately, card draw doesn't come cheap in Faria, so one of the best ways is really just to make sure you have a low land requirement in your deck, and that way we can gain access to as many card draw options on the power wheel as possible. One other weakness to this archetype is its struggle to keep up with bulkier creatures. As I mentioned, Last Nightmare is really the only destroyer target creature card we have, and while we do have soft removal like Humbling Vision and Frogify, these can all be quite costly since we actually need a second card to remove the entire creature. And for this, sadly, I don't have a solution for you. This is one of the reasons you don't see the control archetype being played super frequently in competitive play. It can do great against lower statted decks, but forget trying to combat things like mono green. The last thing I want to touch on is cards that are both creature and removal at the same time. These all make for excellent control cards since they not only remove our opponent's creatures, but we can also use them as collectors, which I mentioned are tough to come by in this archetype. Archetype. And using these types of cards, we can actually build a deck with a lot more creatures. But as we'll discuss later, this actually starts to become ever so slightly less of a control archetype and begins to show some characteristics of a mid-range archetype. <laughs> now we come to Faria's favorite child. Midrange. This is the most flexible and popular archetype in the game, and will contain a fair amount of removal tools, along with a lot of creatures that excel in the mid game, which starts around turn 3 or 4 in most cases. And to top it off, it'll usually have maybe one late game card that scales over the course of the match. The idea with this archetype is to adapt to your opponent's strategy and to the general pacing of the match, depending on what cards each player is drawing and what the board state is looking like. A midrange deck has the tools to be really aggressive, defensive, or take more control lines if need be. And what I just described sounds like the perfect archetype, I just listed every possible playstyle ever, and midrange can do all of it. But, and this is a very tricky and subtle nuance to realize, midrange is not just some archetype that contains cards from every other archetype, we throw all those in a deck and call it a day. No, a midrange deck is still very specifically designed to be a midrange deck. And I think this is important to understand because I've seen a lot of newer players over the past simply throw all the best removal cards in a deck, some of the best creatures, and then try to compare it to top winning tournament decks and can't quite tell what the differences are there. So then, what makes a midrange deck? The key here is flexibility. Not just in the cards themselves, but the deck as a whole. It needs to be able to transition into these different game plans I mentioned using the same cards, no matter what that game plan is. And what I mean by that is Rush has their dedicated Rush cards, Control has their dedicated control cards, but midrange needs cards that are capable of being aggressive, defensive, and controlling. Not necessarily all at the same time, but should the situation arise, we would like our ideal midrange card to cover most of these roles if we play it with the corresponding strategy. A little obscure to think about right now, but let's take a look at some midrange cards to get a better idea. Mobility often plays a huge, huge role in this archetype, and that's because cards that provide high mobility to your creatures allow them to get into different positions on the board very quickly, which is the easiest way to transition from a creature being defensive, protecting your face, to suddenly zipping aggressively to your opponent's face, or vice versa. It also lets you threaten the wells when your opponent isn't expecting it, allowing for those control lines. So mobility comes in the form of events, structures, but also creatures. Charge and jump keywords make for excellent mid-range creatures. Even without surprise events and structures, these mobility keywords allow you to stick to the wells while still being able to make quick shuffles between offensive and defensive positionings. That being these four spots in particular that allow a single creature to double collect. And as we'll talk about later in this series, double collecting is very good. Definitely do that. Any other creature that wants to double collect will have to tuck inside the wells, bringing them quite far away from the actual fight. But you don't have to have high mobility on all your cards. You can also take creatures that just have solid stat lines or other keywords. And one great way to make up for the lack of mobility on a card is the lands used to summon them on. A mid-range deck wants to have most of their strength shine in the mid game, which as I mentioned starts around turn 3 or 4. So you want most of your cards to be playable on turn 2 or 3 when we consider summoning sickness. 
so two or three special lands then would be the goal. But if we want to make up for the potential lack of mobility on a creature, we can consider double neutrals to get our creatures into better positions on the board. This works best with pure neutral or wild creatures since they can be played on neutral spaces, but colored cards can work as well if the positioning is good enough. Usually this means double neutraling to nab that aggressive well spot for Axe Grinder, Mystic Beast, or just some other aggressive creature that can harvest Faria. Now what this means for our less mobile creatures is that in order to still get these down turn 2 or 3, we're actually going to need to cut down on their special land requirements even further and maybe only consider one or two special lands. Events and structures can of course be a little pricier because they don't need to worry about summoning sickness, but when you're building a mid-range deck you want to think about all of this and whether you're going to actually need double neutrals in your matches. The best practice would be to either design a deck that makes full use of these double neutrals, such as what the immobile creatures in a mono red list would call for, or just don't use immobile creatures at all and play yellow flyers. And speaking of yellow flyers, I claimed that mid-range is the most popular archetype in competitive play, and this has mostly been true throughout all of Faria's history. So why is this? Faria wells generate a large portion of each player's economy, and creatures are the only way to harvest that Faria. Mid-range provides a lot of tools both in removal cards and high mobility that allow them to control the wells and keep their opponent off of collections. And midrange provides a lot of tools both in removal cards and high mobility that allow them to control the wells, keep their opponent off of collections, and collect themselves in the process. But so if control is so impactful on the game, why isn't the actual control archetype the most popular? Well, the differences here come with how important it is for the control archetype to keep the board spotlessly clear. Their creatures kind of suck, so if you leave even one enemy on the board for too long, your opponent may find a cheap flashy mobility trick to value trade your one and only collector. Or they may simply drop a giant stat stick, and as I mentioned earlier, it's pretty difficult to come by efficient hard removal. It's not cheap. And don't get me wrong, midrange loves keeping the board clear too, but it's not as important for them because their creatures have a little more fighting potential than control creatures, and they simply have have more creatures in their decks to replace the old ones. It also helps that they have other options in terms of game plan, but that doesn't mean to say you should rule out control as an archetype entirely. They can of course control certain matchups better than a mid-range deck, because that's what it's designed to do, and the same goes for any other archetype. A rush deck will be able to be more aggressive more often than a mid-range deck can. So I've sprinkled in the word pacing here or there throughout this video. And when it comes to tempo, we can get an even better understanding of what I mean by pacing in all these other archetypes. The tempo archetype falls somewhere in between rush and mid-range in terms of pacing. They're fast and aggressive, but still stick to the sides of the wells. The main purpose of tempo is to give up long-term value in exchange for short-term value. This will be slightly less explosive than a rush deck, but the tempo player's creatures will be larger statted to give them staying power during the mid-game. Now I said that mid-range wants to show most of their strength in the mid-game, but in reality, every archetype wants to do well in the mid-game. The differences between the archetypes is that they'll be slightly stronger or weaker at different points in the game. Mid-range does well in the mid-game, but this time period also supports their late-game win conditions. Rush has a lot of early-game pressure, but they generally want to win during the mid-game, and if they get to the late-game, they've probably lost. Tempo has a very similar timing in regards to Rush here, in that they want to win during during the mid game, but they also share similar timings with mid range. The early pressure they apply may cripple their opponent's resources, and unlike the cheaper creatures you'll generally find in Rush, Tempo has larger creatures that may still be able to close out a win in the initial turns of the late game, if they've done a good job of pressuring that is. So what do these larger creatures look like in Tempo? They might not look exactly as you had imagined them, because yes, they have some larger stats here 
here, but they're quite expensive, aren't they? Far from the efficient stats that a Firebringer or Soul Eater can give you, but let's take a look back at some of the typical mid-range creatures that maybe have the same land counts as these. These might be more fairy efficient, but our tempo creatures here have slightly larger stats overall. In a mid-range deck, this extra Feria may be going towards building more lands for the rest of their deck, or setting up a larger board with more creatures. But it takes time to draw into all of these creatures and build up lands. Tempo says, I'm gonna beat you before you can monopolize on all this Feria you're saving, and maybe at the same time I can take favorable trades over these creatures and keep you off of collections for a little while. Now of course as the match goes on, the mid-range player is building up more lands and getting more and more efficient creatures as a reward for this, so at some point as the Tempo player, we're eventually going to see creatures with stat lines able to combat our stuff, and they're doing it more efficiently. This is when the late game hits us like a truck, and we need to scramble to close out our win as soon as possible, or all is lost. Now to make up for the expense of our cards, we can't just rush down the center, we need a little bit of collections from the wells. This means we want to shoot our lands down one side of the wells, and from there push as fast as possible to the enemy's orb. Face is the place in this archetype, so it's really important we dodge whatever side our opponent builds to. In some cases, we can fight the same side if we know the matchup, but remember we don't have that much time to waste before our creatures start becoming obsolete. If you're playing against a swarm archetype, for instance, it can be really tough to get a decent foothold on face in this matchup, when your opponent can simply body block with cheap creatures while they build up their lands and other resources. We also don't have the time to invest lands into double collection spots usually, and in fact a lot of tempo decks will have ways of pushing our lands even further into more aggressive spots with cards like Tow Ship and Shifting Tide. With this land structure, there's still one thing to consider that can help with our aggression. A tempo deck has a really strict deadline on when they need to win the match, and for this reason, we need to jam pack our deck full of these bulky tempo creatures. Removal and a couple mobility tricks are good too, but we need consistency above all else. So most creatures we're drawing into are large but expensive, and this causes some issues with what we call a collector. A cheap mid-range creature is free to sit back on a fairy well and collect to its heart's content, but a tempo creature is a super large investment, and we can't just have five fairy worth of a creature sitting back and sipping on Feria Martinis. One or two collections is good, and then all soldiers to the front line. It may feel a little sad leaving this back Feria well when you've already built land there, but that's what tempo is all about, giving up seemingly easy value for aggression. Of course, if we do have a cheaper creature like Origin Fanatic, which is seen often in Tempo, we can use this to collect for a little bit longer if needed. So that's the Tempo archetype, but we can also use the concept of this in other archetypes as well. In a mid-range deck, for example, we could make a Tempo play to give us a really strong advantage on the current turn in exchange for losing out on potential late game value. The easiest way to think about this is to look at a card like Wave Crash Colossus in a standard blue midrange. The best value we can get out of this card is by collecting from our opponent's wells four times to get this down to a four cost. But we shouldn't feel restricted into only allowing ourselves to play this as a four cost card. Sometimes an opportunity may present itself where playing this as maybe a six cost could give us a large advantage on the board. One thing you do have to be very aware of though is what this means when we make a tempo play like this. What we need to gain from this play in order to make it worth it. So in a dedicated tempo deck, we are constantly making tempo plays because that's what our deck is designed to do. And we need to win the game as soon as possible to make up for the lost late game value. But if you're just making a tempo play in another archetype, this doesn't have to be such a dire condition. Maybe making our value back on this play just involves taking control over a well that we otherwise wouldn't have the tools for. Maybe this play is being made defensively so as not to die, and maybe it does involve winning the game before our tempo value becomes obsolete, but this doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Whatever the condition is to make our value back, there is the very real possibility that we don't succeed in this condition, or maybe we misjudge just how valuable a 6 cost Colossus was on this certain turn. And this can hurt a lot, because yeah, that could 
would have been a four cost Colossus on a future turn, and maybe that extra two Feria we saved could have done more for us. But on the other hand, maybe not. This is a super tricky strategy to understand. It'll be different for every situation, and the only way to really master this technique is to try it out for yourself and evaluate after the match whether or not it paid off. And so if tempo plays can be made in other archetypes, can we do similar mixing and matching with all the archetypes? Well, when I told you that each archetype was distinct, I sort of lied to you, somewhat. But hear me out, because the areas where this distinction falls short are very specific and very subtle. These four archetypes we discussed fall on a spectrum in terms of their speed and pacing, and the lines between each of these can sometimes be a little blurry. There are still distinct builds for each archetype, but a mid-range deck, for example, can sometimes take tempo or control lines. A dedicated control list can sometimes take mid-range lines. This can also vary deck to deck. Some mid-range lists can be built closer to the tempo side of the spectrum, allowing it to take even more tempo lines than it normally could, and some lists can be built closer to the control side. I think you get the idea, but now what about non-adjacent archetypes? Can a mid-range deck take rush lines? And the answer is yes, but it's going to be a lot more difficult. If you're rushing as a mid-range deck, you better have a good reason for it. This reason is usually because of a really poor matchup where you have no confidence in winning with the mid-range game plan, and rushing is just a desperate attempt at improving those winning odds. We'll talk a lot more about this concept in a future video as well as the concept of racing during other parts of a match, but hopefully this can give you some insight for now on the pacing of archetypes. So if mid-range and rush have distant relationships with each other, like I have with grass, surely control and rush are impossibly distant. And okay, technically rush decks are somewhat of a control archetype themselves. Most of the time in rush, you're wanting to control your opponent's board in order to make up for your lack of collections. But this is done in a very different way than what I would call an actual control archetype. So perhaps the naming scheme here is a little problematic. When I say control archetype, I'm talking about the the type of deck that is filled with removal cards and needs to go for the close sidewells to gather as much fairy as possible for their slower game plan. This type of list is super far away from rush on the spectrum, so you can almost never go for rush lines. The reverse is also true in the sense that rush decks can never really go for the sides of their wells and slow play it. They can take control lines, but like I said, this graph is mainly showing the pacings that each archetype is capable of. But now you may be looking at this graph and thinking, excuse me, Mr. Moon, but we seem to be missing one. And now is where we talk about the final archetype, Combo. Perfect! I've kept Combo off this spectrum because this archetype doesn't directly affect pacing like the others do. You can have a combo rush list, such as with Path to Face, but you can also have combo lists with a more control-oriented pacing, such as that from a Karasius combo, which plays quite slowly. In fact, if we really want to add combo to our little graph here, the lines would look a lot more like this, creating four different speeds of combo that all cross over with the other four archetypes. If you've been playing Feria for a long time, and watch some of the old YouTubers and Twitch streamers, they used to always talk about building control lands to the sides of your orb when playing certain decks like Green Yellow Sack or other slower combo decks. When in reality, these decks were never what I would call a control archetype. They didn't have a focus on controlling the board, but rather investing all their resources into building up to a late game win condition. And the naming scheme here is unfortunate once again, since they weren't entirely wrong. These decks do have the pacing of a control type of list. They do build the exact same lands a control deck would want to build, but the only thing missing is the actual controlling of the board. Combo is less concerned in interacting with your opponent's creatures and the board, and is more concerned with building up cards and other resources that benefit a solitary win condition. This win condition could be a giant creature with 20 plus attack that one-shots your opponent, or it could just be some combination of cards that builds up a really strong board, unmanageable for other archetypes to deal with. Sometimes the win condition may not even care about face damage, and simply summoning an absurd amount of Karasius 
is your ticket to winning the match. Most of the time when players think about combo, they'll think about OTK combos or Karasius, something really nasty and devastating you can pull all your cards towards. But combo doesn't necessarily have to be so potent. There are more subtle decks that simply build up a strong board or chip away at your opponent's life with several burn cards. Emerald Salamander benefits from comboing with multiple swarmy creatures. Some greedy land ramp decks play Aurora's creation a bunch of times on high land cards, which require creation, the high land card, and land ramp cards, which I would definitely all consider as combo cards in this case. These types of decks may once again blur the lines of our graph that we've been building up, since the win conditions here have a bit more interactivity with our opponent than a pure OTK list would. Most combo decks, though, will find themselves under the control pacing side of things, since it generally takes up quite a while to build up large combos. And even some of the quicker combo lists like Rubiak OTK force your opponent to rush to you if they realize what you're playing regardless of what archetype they're playing so the pacing of these matches accelerates and still makes it feel like you're kind of playing a slower control list anyways. Now, combo gets its name from comboing different cards or other pieces of the game together, and comboing cards together can be quite taxing on the structure of your deck, because in order to increase the chances of having two or more particular cards in your hand at the same time, or maybe even just over the course of the match, you'll have to throw in as many of those combo pieces in your deck as possible, along with draw cards and or feria generation cards, so you can focus on hitting that draw button or plus one on the power wheel. As a side effect to this, combo decks usually have very few removal options, and the further up the combo spectrum you go, meaning the more combo pieces you need, the less removal you'll be able to fit into your deck. Just like we discussed in Tempo, some plays, or rather cards you play, are inherently combo cards, regardless of whether you play them in a combo deck or a mid-range deck. Let's take Feed the Forest as an example. This is a great card, and doesn't necessarily have to be used only in combo decks, but at the end of the day, it's still a combo card. It needs something else to even be played, which in this case is just a creature, but that's still a required combo piece, because that creature is actually being consumed with the feed here, unlike a simple buff or something. And even if you're playing a non-combo deck, it's still really important to realize the weight this has on your deck. Remember, if we want combo cards to work well, we need some form of feria generation and card draw, either with draw cards or ways to hit the power wheels draw and plus one options more often. In Feed the Forest case, both of these things are thankfully already built into the card. There may be some other issues with excess feria if you don't have the right deck to support it, but Feed does a decent job of fixing these combo issues. The bigger problems will occur with cards like Deathwalker. You'll have to manually fix the lack of card draw here in deck building. The sacrifice mechanic itself gets a little more complicated than this, where you need cheap bodies to sacrifice and now you've got other card draw issues due to low deck weight, but that's a concept for another time. The main takeaway I want you to get from this is recognizing what a combo card is and some of the ways you can complement that in deck building. So that is every general archetype in Feria. You can get a little more specific in saying there's a Yellow Flyers archetype or a Sacrifice archetype, but every competitive deck should find a home in one of these five general archetypes. And if you're not building your deck towards one of these, that may be something you should be taking a closer look at. Some decks can share certain aspects with each other depending on their position within the graph, and sometimes, in very rare cases, there can be anomalies that try to break break these rules altogether, but this can get very advanced and unfortunately I don't have time to talk about all of these intricacies. This video has already been way longer than I was hoping it to be, I could have made this into an entire series with how much there is to discuss here. Oh, what's that? I have already started making entire series discussing different archetypes suggested by viewers like you? Well Gadzooks, why didn't you say so? I guess all I have to do now is click the links on screen to my Feria Workshop streams discussing complex archetypes, my Countering Archetypes Guide series and the next installment of my Advanced Feria series where you'll learn how these archetypes interact with one another as we discuss how to navigate matchups. I won't take any more of your time then, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you over there.